Easter changes everything. Easter, for the Christian, is the most important event here on earth. The Apostle Paul cut to the core of Christianity with a statement. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 13 and 14, where he said, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If Christ has indeed been risen from the dead, then what are the implications for how we live? You know, we live in a society that wrestles with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, we just can't overlook the resurrection and believe in Jesus. They're together. 
because we serve a living Savior. Many today say there are so many good teachings about Christianity that we should be able to focus on them without believing in the resurrection. While those statements might seem a little strange and a little odd, they are not far from the truth in many people's minds. The, generation, the Gen Z generation, that's people that are born after 2000, mainly teenagers. The Barna group said, this group of teenagers are the most non-Christian generation in American history. He goes on to say, as only four out of 100 teens holds to a true biblical worldview, his research discovered that there are more teens today that are a part of Generation Z that identify themselves as agnostic, atheistic, or not religiously affiliated. Yes, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, then I have to remind all of us, each one of us are facing a grave. You know, some people are so afraid of dying, they will go to extraordinary lengths to try to avoid the grave. They'll do everything possible. They will seek out the, the greatest doctors to keep them alive as long as they can. In fact, today, if many have went to this process, there's a process called cryonics, in which you have your body submerged in liquid nitrogen in minus 100 degrees. And what this institute will do, it will give cryonic suspension services. And as soon as possible, after a person legally dies, that member patient is prepared and cooled to a temperature where his physical decay eventually stops. He will be placed in this freezer to be kept until medicine finds a way to bring them back to life. If you were to go to Scottsdale, Arizona, you would see this place that has been prepared. It's not cheap. The, the beginning price starts around $180,000. I understand Ted Williams is there today. And I understand Kanye West is among those who is on the waiting list. He wants to be frozen after this so he can be thawed in the future when representative advances will allow him to live again. And if you don't have the 180000 you can pay 100000 have your head decapitated, and they will suspend your head, and they will find a youthful body when they come up with the right medications and the right new uh, medicine to put you with a younger body. Folks, people don't want to die. But we have to face the reality that in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, what it reminds us, it's appointed unto men once to die, and then after this, the judgment. Brother Thompson and I had the privilege this past week to be in Washington, D.C. for a conference, and we got the chance to be at the Bible Museum. What a great place, and I hope you get a chance to visit. Five floors, you can't do it in a day. It takes a lot of time to see all that they have placed there. But God's Word is still alive in Washington, D.C., and we're so thankful for that. But while we were there in Washington, D.C., we visited some of the monuments. We went by Thomas Jefferson's monument, the, one of our founding fathers, a very great man. Nevertheless, he could not accept the miracles of Jesus Christ. So what he did, he took and made his own Bible. It was a special version, which all the reference to the supernatural were deleted. No miracles, no resurrection. In editing the Gospels, he confirmed himself solely to the moral teachings of Jesus. He says, those are good. The closing words of Jefferson's Bible go like this. There laid they Jesus and rolled a great stone at the mouth of the sepulcher and departed. Folks, our Savior didn't stay in the grave. If they if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then every one of us today is facing a grave. Some people are, uh, understand that. In 1887, 
22 years after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, in fact, he was assassinated on a Good Friday, we just celebrated. 22 years later, many were thinking that he wasn't dead. So they had his, dug, his grave dug up, and they saw his body there, and they were confirmed. But the rumors continued, so 14 years later, 36 years, let's make sure that he's for sure dead. And there were witnesses there to testify that Lincoln was still in the grave. Church, three days later, when Jesus was placed in the grave, he had rumors that began to spread throughout the land of Israel. Only this time, there were no witnesses who could say that they had seen his body. He's alive. He's alive. In fact, to the contrary, many witnesses, as we see here in our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, over 500 plus, that were able to see our Savior after he died there on the cross. They saw his body, and he was alive. You see, as great a man as Abraham Lincoln was, there were witnesses to prove he was still in the grave. If one of our leaders in Washington, D.C. were to cry out today to Lincoln, or if a scientist were to cry out to Einstein for help, there would only be an empty silence, no response. They would not be able to, to help him. If someone were to call out to any of our religious or philosophical uh, leaders, Muhammad, Buddha, Gandhi, folks, there would be no help from them because they're in a grave. Jesus' resurrection is the most powerful event in human history. It's more powerful than a volcanic eruption or a devastating as an earthquake or floods, hurricanes, tsunamis or a nuclear explosion all put together. As scientist Henry Morris, who was one of the founders of the Creation Reach Institute, stated, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof, the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is false religion. If it did not take place, then Christ is God, and the Christian faith is absolute truth. If it did take place. Folks, we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Jesus is rising physically, visibly, bodily from that tomb. Gives hope to each of us this morning as we worship together. There isn't just another wonderful gospel story, folks or a series of amazing miracles. This is a story of the miracles of Christianity. It ties together all the other strands of our faith, and it's based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He didn't stay in the grave. Sunday was a coming after Good Friday, and this morning we're here to celebrate, we're to worship. You know, as a child growing up, I learned a lot of stories about Jesus. I went to church early on, and I remember hearing the good things about what Jesus had done, the miracles that he performed. I, I, I listened intently. The way he treated people, he was an amazing man. I, I heard about the good things he had done. And I heard that he had died. And I heard the fact that his body was placed into a tomb, and that three days later, he rose again. He came back. But I want to remind you, and I want to insist that we understand this, knowing the stories about Jesus really didn't make much difference in my life. You see, I knew the stories. I had a head experience. I had a head knowledge. And I thought this was wonderful. Thank you for what you've done. But folks, I didn't have a personal experience. I didn't have a personal relationship in those early days of my life. But at the age of 12, I heard for the very first time, clearly I understood Mark Mortensen is a sinner. And that Jesus Christ came into this world to die for me and to die for you. He placed himself on the cross so that we could have eternal life. 
that we could know and have a personal relationship with Him. Knowing Jesus makes all the difference in the world, personally. They thought He was dead that day. They thought He was never coming back. You see, all four Gospels talk about Jesus being raised back to life. And they appear to his followers. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus appears to two men in chapter 24 of Luke. These two men were relieving Jerusalem. They were returning back to their homes. They were saddened. You see, they were followers of Jesus Christ. Perhaps they had been following him all three years. We're not quite sure of that. But they had been to Jerusalem They heard that Jesus died on the cross. They heard all the commotion. They heard all the things that were going on. And they were just sad as they were going back to their home. What were they going to do? Their life had completely changed because God was, Jesus was no longer on the scene. They thought, well, we could go back to our businesses. We could go back to normal life as we used to know it before Jesus came and changed us. And they talked back and forth, and all of a sudden, a third person appeared walking along beside them. It was Jesus. He was somewhat disguised. They didn't recognize him. And they were talking, and he piped into the conversation. What are you talking about? What are you referring to? And and they said, you haven't heard? And so they went on to tell him, we just returned from Jerusalem. Jesus is dead. He's in a tomb. He's not alive. All our hope of a Savior, all of our hope of a Messiah, our hope is gone. We don't know what to do. We're saddened. As he asked what happened, and here's these men talking about these things about Jesus. All the powerful miracles that he performed while he was here on earth. All that he was, did as a great teacher But we remember the leading priest, the high priest, handed him over to die. And they crucified him. They said, we lost all hope. We no longer have a Messiah. Then they said, there are rumors that Jesus is alive. But that's just it. They're just rumors. Jesus responds to those two men as they were down in the dumps. And he says, oh, foolish Men, you find it hard to believe all that the prophets had written. You find it hard to believe what the scriptures have given to us through Moses. Was it not clearly predicted? Didn't you know it was going to happen? That the Messiah would suffer all things. Then he explained all the things of himself to these men. He explained what happened to him. He explained the prophecies. And then he said, here's the thing. That Jesus was at work fulfilling the scriptures. He had to. You see, in the Old Testament, we have promise after promise after promise that he's coming again. It had been planned all along that he would live. That he would suffer. That he would die. And he'd be raised back to life. Folks, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't a tragic incident that Jesus died at Passover. It was all the plan of God. To allow his son to suffer, as we observed on Friday night, and hearing those words from that cross, it is finished. And taking him down from the cross, and wrapping his body, and putting him in ointment, and placing him in the tomb, it was a gloomy day. Then, as they're eating with this man, their eyes were open. They were enjoying that meal with Jesus. Suddenly, that moment, as they had seen Jesus all along the road and now enjoying a little meal with him, he disappears. You see, Emmaus was about a seven-mile journey. And they were walking. They didn't have any cars. They didn't have a horse to ride. Seven miles takes quite a bit of time, and I'm sure it was a hot road that they went. But as they arrived in Emmaus, those two men on the Emmaus roads, those two followers of Jesus Christ, got excited. They saw Jesus. And they couldn't keep the news to themselves. 
They went back to Jerusalem. And I believe this time they didn't walk. I believe this time they were jogging. They were running. They couldn't wait to tell everyone, we saw Jesus. We're not sure where he went. He disappeared on us. But we saw him. He's alive. And as they were talking to the other disciples and the other followers of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden here comes Jesus again and appears before those followers of his Jesus opened the scriptures to help them understand that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would suffer, would die, and rise again three days later. This morning, as we think about the thought of Resurrection Sunday and Easter changes everything of these uh, disciples on that Emmaus road, There's three things I want to close with this morning, the significance of the resurrection. It's so important that we grasp this. As I told you earlier, as a child, I knew all these stories. I had all these things in my mind, and I thought they were great, but they were here, and they were not here. I never knew Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Jesus' resurrection means our sins are forgiven. Folks, that's amazing. That's wonderful because I'm a sinner. We are born in our trespasses and we're dead. A dead person cannot do anything in his own merit to earn himself salvation, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is reminding us in verses 3 and verses 4 that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried. That he was raised on that third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then in verse number 17, he argues that if Christ had not been raised, your faith is vain and you're still in your sins. It's futile. It's no good. In other words, Paul was a direct connection between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the sufficiency of his death to atone for our sins. You see, remember, Paul was one of those ones that heard the stories. He heard about all the miracles that were going on. He heard all these good things, and he was a good man. But in his faith, we couldn't have him. And so he went about to persecute Christians. But then Paul came to a heart-to-heart relationship with Jesus Christ. there on the Damascus Road. And he was blinded, and he saw Jesus. And his life was changed, and he writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says in Romans chapter 4 that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Because of his death, we have forgiveness of sins. Because of his resurrections, we can carry to the world that there is forgiveness of sins. For all who repent, for all who turn to God, Jesus died to offer forgiveness to all who repent. Not just a head knowledge, but to those that recognize and realize that they're a sinner. Now, I repent. I recognize I have to turn to God's way. You see, repent is very simple. It says I've been living my own life. I've been going my own direction. I've been doing without God. But when I come face to face with my sin, I realize of my punishment, my debt. I deserve to die. You see, without Jesus, we live a meaningless life. Without Jesus Christ, we live this meaningless life. And when you and I repent and we seek his forgiveness, we begin a new relationship. He becomes our Savior. John 11 puts puts it this way, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become a child of God, a son of God. You become his child. You are adopted into the family of God. Not because we deserved it, but because God loved us so much. Folks, Easter changes everything. There's a second point I want to point out, and it's Jesus' resurrection means death is once and for all. It means death is defeated. It should have the word defeated uh, that is once and for all. You see, as Peter proclaimed on that day of Pentecost, God raised Jesus from the dead. 
freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to hold him there. You see, he defeated it once and for all. The resurrection means that Jesus not only defeated death for himself, but he defeated it for all of us. He died. He rose as a new representative for humanity and as the second Adam, but now is Christ risen from the dead, Paul writes. Perhaps no one has said this more eloquently than the theologian C.S. Lewis in his book, Miracles. And let me share this with you. It says the New Testament writers speak as if Christ's achievement in rising from the dead was the first event of its kind, the whole history of the universe. He is the first fruits. He is the pioneer of life. He has forced open a door that has been locked since the death of the first man, Adam. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he has done so. This is the beginning of the new creation. A new chapter in cosmic history has been opened. Folks, the empty tomb assures us that the sickness that we go through, the suffering that we go through, the illness or the cancer that we get, death and disease will not have the final word. It's been defeated. It's been defeated. It's been defeated. There's a third thing I want you to notice. Jesus' res resurrection means that the material world matters. The material world matters. Lest there be any misunderstanding, when the apostles said that Jesus rose again, they meant that his physical body came back to life. The risen Jesus wasn't a phantom he wasn't a ghost just kind of flying around, but a breakfast-eating, flesh-and-bone human being. There is no afterlife, those that say. The life is all there is. We have all the counter-arguments of what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We look forward to the promise of a resurrection, folks. I don't know if the Lord tarries his coming. We might be the ones that go up when he does come. But if we do go down, the undertaker might put me down, but the upper taker will take me up. I will be with him. And I will have a, a, a material body. We'll be recognized. You see, when the disciple, when uh, Peter, James, and John were with Jesus there on the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw Moses. They recognized him. He wasn't a ghost. He was recognizable in the body. And you and I, as we go to heaven, we'll be recognized. You see, the biblical doctrine of resurrection of the dead begins with the human body, but extends far beyond it. Listen to what R.A. Torrey, great pastor of the past of Moody Bible Institute and Moody Bible Church, he said, we will not be disembodied spirits in a world to come, but redeemed spirits in redeemed bodies in a redeemed universe, incorruptible bodies. You see, you know, some of us have had to have surgeries. Some of us had to put on glasses. Some of us have fought cancer and have had to have treatments by medication, chemo, or radiation. Because these bodies are not going to go on forever. But we're promised, because of his death, that we'll have a material body once again. But this body won't be like in this body. We won't have to take medications to fight the flu and get shots. We're immune because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Well, what does this all mean? How do we kind of finalize it up as we think about it here? Well, the application, number one, our sins are forgiven. Are you here this morning, redeemed child of God? Have you come to know him as your personal Savior? Have you asked him to come into your heart? Folks, it changed my life. It changed the direction of my life. Everything changed. Easter changed everything for Mark Mortensen. I'm so thankful that God got a hold of me when I was young. I'm so thankful that my story doesn't end, that I just continued on to live a selfish life. But because of what Jesus did for me, I've been able to live it for him. I'm so thankful that I was able to marry a wife that believed the same way that I did. And we raised three children that came to church and heard the gospel story and opened their heart to Jesus Christ. And now I got seven grandchildren. Now, not all of them know Jesus Christ because they're still little. 
But you know what? Easter changed everything for my wife and I, and we know and believe that that's going to be the same for our children's children. Folks, our sins are forgiven. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. No, none of us are perfect. We need the payment that Jesus paid for us. He said payment is paid in full. We don't owe a debt. He paid it. And when Jesus looks at me, he doesn't see the sinful Mark Mortensen. He puts on me the robe of righteousness to see me as if I had never sinned. Our sins are forgiven. Let me give a second thought as we think about this Resurrection Sunday. Folks, death is not the end. Death is not the end. We are happy to say as we think about it this morning, death is not the end. We're going to go on. We will continue to to live for him and and to be able to, to see life the way he promised it, the way he allowed us. That's not the end. We're not going to be finished. There is a Savior. And as you think about it, Jesus conquered the grave. And he promised that we can follow in his footsteps. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21, the Apostle Paul, as he was remarkably changed and saved, gives us these words as how his life was changed so our lives have changed. Philippians chapter 3, he says, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he's able even to subdue all things unto himself. Death is not the end. Those angels told the women at the grave that day, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here but he is risen. Because of the erection of Christ, death no longer has power over us. The Bible says for the child of God, for the believer, the one that has a personal relationship with him, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There will be that day if God does not come back before he takes us. We'll take that last breath. And when we do, we'll be immediately brought into the throne of heaven. And then the last thing I think is so vital and so important as we think about Resurrection Sunday, Easter changes everything. Folks, how we live is so important. You see, we serve a holy God. And as a holy God, he hates sin. He cannot tolerate sin. And once he redeemed us, he wants us to live for him. He wants to walk in newness of life. Folks, we still have the old nature. I know that because he tries to erupt in my... Hey, he tries to, to, to cause us daily problems. He'd love for us to throw ourselves and in a matter of moments just mess our lives up so our testimony would be worthless. How we live our life is vital. It's important. In my life, he says, Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, never lest I... Uh, live, but Christ liveth in me. Folks, we take him wherever we go. Are you a testimony for Jesus Christ? Well, people say, there's somebody different. Their life, their walk, their, their manner. I've not seen like many like that. That's what Jesus Christ ought to be doing in our life. We should be showing that. How you and I live is important. How we go about. There in Gospel of Matthew, we read a particular verse that says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In other words, why live this life and be successful in everything you do and yet lose your own soul? There's many that have no meaning in life. They're just living to live. Oh, they're climbing the corporate ladder and they're accomplishing a lot of good things. And they're getting money. They're able to provide for their family. But if they don't know Jesus Christ, they lose their own soul. You see, your soul is important. And only Jesus Christ can save our soul. Despite what people say, Buddha can't save your soul. Confucius can't save your soul. Muhammad can't save your soul. Only Jesus Christ can save your soul because he is the Son of God. 
who died for your sins. He is the one who rose from the dead with all power and all might. And if we want our souls to be saved, we must trust in Jesus Christ. Because we know we will live forever in God's presence, your priorities, my priorities, our devotions should be focused on Him, not on the concerns of our present world. The focus should not take us out of this world, but keep our attention where it belongs. And I love what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. Set your affections on things above, not things on earth. In fact, as we sum this all up this morning, living with your hearts focused on eternity enables us to be more effective in God's business, living out His truth and building His kingdom right here and now. There was a famous artist who had a picture that was painted in one of the European museums. It was a story about a famous person that had lived. He was by the name of Faust. He was a German astrologer who sold his soul to the devil in exchange for knowledge, in exchange for power. And he was basically playing chess with the devil in this picture. And in that painting, the devil was checkmating Faust. And he was claiming his soul in victory. Over the years, people have looked at that painting in that museum. And for certain identification, they, they would go by and feel, wow, it's hopeless. There's no way in the world that Faust can get out of this checkmate. He's done. He's doomed. He's finished. Finally, somebody who was really good at chess studied that chessboard. And hours and hours studying that game board he says, it's a lie. It's a lie. The painting is wrong. The knight and the king have another move. And he doesn't have to be checkmated. Now, I enjoy the game of chess, but I'm not the greatest chess player. But I understand what it means to be checkmated. And many of us feel this way about death. And as you think about it, the empty tomb of our Lord says, that's a lie. That's a lie. You are not doomed. You're not defeated. You have hope. We have a Savior, Jesus Christ, who arose on the third day to give us life. Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh death, is your victory? Paul understood that. Oh, he lived a life without God for many years. But oh, those latter days of his life were changed forever because of what Jesus Christ did for him. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we've assembled this morning on this special occasion, this special day in our calendar, Resurrection Sunday, thank you for that day. Thank you for that day that you provided a gift. You provided hope by allowing your son to go through the agony of a crucifixion death. To literally suffer and be cursed upon and spit upon and to be beaten so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. Lord, this morning as we have thought about that Resurrection Sunday, possibly in our auditorium, there could be someone here today that doesn't know you as their Savior. And my prayer and my desire, Lord, is that if that be the case, we just pray your Holy Spirit is showing that person. Just like I, as a child, had the stories down. I knew them. I could quote them. But I didn't have a relationship with you. I thank you, Lord, for how you saved my life and how you changed it and how you've changed many in the lives of the people that sit in this auditorium this morning. But, Lord, if there is that one that doesn't know you, oh, Lord, wouldn't it be great on this Resurrection Sunday for them to find the hope that lies beyond the grave. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. 
Amen.